Today I'll be talking about some preliminary work from us uh, at the Robust Consensus Group on modeling uh, the PBS auction in a dynamic way. And this should also be applicable to proposer builder separation uh, and order flow auctions. So first I'll give a bit of a recap on PBS. Uh, in this setting we're looking at more of an agnostic uh, PBS setting, so we're not looking at MEV boost specifically or ePBS. We're looking at the design philosophy that splits the validator's role into a block building and to proposing a block and splitting the complexity of block building, which will have these uh, centralization forces uh, so that we can keep a decentralized validator set. And the goal of PBS would be to allow all proposers to have equal access to MEV markets. Currently, we see that PBS is in the form of MEV boost, um, and people bid via trusted relay that then um, forwards their, their bid to some proposer. Uh, and some builders and relays might collude, meaning that there's some latency advantages here that you can achieve that others might not be able to achieve, which might defeat some of the goals of PBS that we have currently. We also see that arbitrage between decentralized and centralized exchanges is a large part of the MEV that can be extracted currently, which is formalized by Jason uh, in the Lever papers. And there are some proposals around separating PBS into more complicated um, protocol and forest proposer commitments, where you could, for example, have a top of block part that allows for uh, people to bid on these arbitrages and the rest of the block part where people can bid for other parts. We'll go into this a bit later. First of all, what we're seeing now is that MEV boost auction mechanism is a true mess if we look at it from an auction theoretical perspective. What we see here is on the x-axis we have time, on the y-axis we have the med median bid value, and all the different colored dots represent different builders. And we see that there is a lot of disparity between bidding strategies. So for example, the, in the bottom corner, we see that there's a red line, red dotted line, uh, which represents some builder, and there's a blue dotted line, which represents another builder. And these are quite far apart, and seem to remain, this difference seems to remain quite constant. This could probably be attributed to some form of exclusive order flow. We see that some builders only start bidding very late into the slot. Uh, and we even see that median bid value might decrease for some builders, and this could be due to bid cancellations, where, for example, external state moves uh, meaning that your MEV extraction uh, might be less profitable. So now um, we're trying to move from this very messy data that, that, um, that was nicely formulated by Thomas from our research group to a more theoretical model to be able to understand PBS also for the long run. Like what happens if this messy data uh, gets more efficient and we need to extrapolate to a, a long-term future. So we are interested in the following relationships in this PBS auction, where people don't only compete on price, but they also compete on latency. So we're looking at what's the effect of latency on bidders' profits, where bidders in the PBS auction will be builders, and what's the effect of latency on auction revenue for proposers. And we're not modeling any centralization here or long-run behavior where people might choose between investing in latency or uh, investing in higher bids. Uh, and we're also not modeling risk-reverse bidders, which means we're not interested in inventory risk models here. Uh, we're only looking at the behavior between bidders. And the classic example for such an auction would be uh, a common value auction where the uh, auction of item uh, follows some distribution, let's say it's uniform on zero to one, and all bidders get a signal based on this distribution, which is identically uh, distributed. Uh, so for example, some builders might think that this block will be worth 0.6 ETH, and the other builders might think that it's worth 0.2 ETH, but the important part is that they actually don't know. Uh, and some people may overestimate this. And we see here that we're making the assumption that um, the auction of item is pure common value, so we're not looking at any exclusive order flow for now. Okay, something that's maybe um, not, not fulfilling from this model is that we're not actually modeling any latency parts here. So if we're looking at what might be more realistic is how MEV moves throughout the slot, so we start at T0, and we'll go through T12 uh, at the end of the slot, and we see that at the end of the slot, we'll extract this value V, uh, and in this case, it might be one, uh, or it might be any other number, uh, but it moves throughout the slot. So if you're a builder and you're um, looking at this market and you're considering when to bid, uh, you see that there's lots of variance and you don't actually know uh, what will be the true value. So let's implement some build bidders here. Let's say there's bidder one and bidder two. Bidder two um, commits to their blo block at a way later time. So maybe they have better latency, uh, they're faster or whatever. Uh, they can commit to their block at a later time, meaning that they're closer to the actual value. And we see here that bidder one has to commit way earlier at T7, um, where they actually are not that sure about the actual value that will happen. So from here, we can already kind of intuitively see that bidder two has an advantage and that this bidder will probably uh, make some profit. But we'll go into some cases where this might not be true later. 
So we're modeling this with some stochastic price process uh, because the amount of MEV that, that's collected over time is stochastic with some drift coefficients because of transaction inflow uh, and also some MEV that can decrease um, because of external factors like uh, the set price mov moving closer to the decentralized exchange price. Uh, and we observe this currently because of bit cancellations. Uh, and for now, we'll use the geometric Brownian motion to get some closed form solutions for this. So the difference here with the classic example is that signals aren't actually conditional on the value that's being auctioned off. We had in the previous example, uh, first you determine the value that's being auctioned off, and given this value, people receive their signals. This is not the case here, which makes it more difficult. The distribution of value conditional on bidder signals is actually different for each bidder. So if you have um, lower, uh, lower latency, so you're faster to the item being auctioned off, you don't only have an estimate that's probably closer to the true value, um, but your confidence intervals are a little smaller as well. Whereas if you're very far away, you have very wide confidence intervals. And the difficult part is that you actually have uh, two signals. You have the, your last observed price, and you have your latency. And this latency is very important, not only because of the price that you observe, but also because you might be slower than other people. We'll define two separate forms of latency here. Um, so all builders receive a latency signal uh, that's private to them. Uh, and this will follow some distribution that's identical for all, uh, for all bidders. And based on this latency, they'll observe their price. But the important thing here is that we distinguish between absolute latency and relative latency. And you see here this graph of builders, relays, and proposers. Uh, where, for example, we could say that the portion from the builder to the relay is relative latency and the part from relay to proposer is absolute latency, um, which might be true in an, in an MEV boost model where there is not that complicated of relays and latency is very similar, or you could replace relays by a P2P network here if you're looking at enshrined PBS. Uh, but we could also define it differently where builders and relays are co-located. Uh, this is, um, this is their, sorry, this, it should be relative latency there and the parts from the relay to the proposer uh, will be absolute latency. What we're seeing now is that there are a lot of latency reductions. Um, for example, we have vertically integrated builders, which is a big topic of conversation during this conference, and some other paid services. And these are more relative latency reductions. You could see, for example, the optimistic relay, which reduces some of the load on the relay as an absolute latency reduction, because it gives everyone the same access to the latency reduction, so there's no competition for this. Uh, and this is reminiscent of what we see in traditional finance, where uh, this is a graph of um, some microwave routes between two exchanges. Um, and we see that the, there's a large decrease in the top part of the latency on the, above the red bar. Uh, and this is like the relative latency reduction. But then there is a theoretical lowest latency limit, which is like the absolute latency reductions. And um, how we are currently in the PBS ecosystem is that even this theoretical latency could uh, be reduced a lot because we could just make a more efficient system. So let's go back to our scenario and we'll implement this relative latency and absolute latency. You'll see that there's some absolute latency at the end, so no bidder will be able to bid in this part, so there will be some uncertainty for all bidders. Uh, and there will be some relative latency in front of that, uh, where bidder one and bidder two receive their price signals. And we'll do a very naive strategy for now. So if we assume that this is a geometric running motion, uh, we could, for example, say that a uh, naive strategy would be I bid um, according to my expectation of future price, which is basically my current price plus the drift that I expect to happen over time. So this is represented by the little arrows that you see in the, in the, in the graph here. And what you see here is that bidder one observes their price earlier. They observe a lower price. Um, so they'll bid probably lower because they're just adding some constants because of their, their time difference to the actual time of execution. And then there's bidder two who um, observe the price a little later, and they'll bid higher. So this isn't close because they have, um, have lower confidence intervals or something. This is just because they use a very naive strategy, and they uh, bid according to their expectation of future price. So in this case, uh, this might work well, out well for everyone, and bidder two wins and bidder one lost because this is what we expect. But there are some other cases that could be more interesting. So if we look at uh, this case, it's the same graph as the previous one, except that the end is inverted. Uh, we see that bidder one observes their price earlier than bidder two, but the amount of MEV that bidder one observes is a lot higher, actually, than the amount of MEV that bidder two observes. Now, if they both use their naive strategy and think that the MEV that they could be attracting is just their current MEV plus some drift coefficient, bidder one will actually bid a lot higher than bidder two, 
and they will win the auction, but they'll suffer some loss, actually, because you can see that the amount, that the V is only 0.2, uh, but the expectation of future profits for beta 1 is a lot higher. So here, not only does uh, the latency advantage of beta 2 mean that they have a better price estimate, it actually means that they, that they are avoid from some uh, twists because they, they have less information than other bidders. So the question now is, what can bidder 1 do to be better off? Well, they could condition on, uh, they could condition their expectation on winning the auction. So if you do this, um, you can basically use the information that other bidders have um, and put this into your own bid. So given that you win, this must mean that other bidders have, res uh, if someone else came after you, it must mean that they have observed some information that means that your position is actually worse off. So conditioning on this, you would probably make some bit shading uh, to account for this. And this is what we would call the winner's curse. So in this scenario, if you were the winner and you didn't account for it, you would have some regrets because you lost money in, uh, in reality. So conditioning on winning means that they can aggregate more information uh, into the price of their bid. So the implications for PBS are quite interesting in the case that there, there will be quite some bid shading and there's more strategic bidding to be done. Uh, lots of builders have committed now to no strategic bidding, uh, but this might be necessary to some extent. Uh, the winner's curse can be interpreted as adverse selection costs between bidders, and this is different from the classic auction model where some people might have more information, uh, might have different information than others, but in this case, some information is strictly better than others, and winning means that other people would have um, bid less than you, meaning that there's like actual adverse selection costs and not just some um, risk associated with the auction itself. Relative latency reductions uh, mean a le uh, less adverse selection cost. So if you're bidding at T7 and someone else bids at T11, there could have been an, a giant uh, decrease in price. But if this is, for example, a very small uh, delta, uh, this decrease in price is likely to be less. And this could be an argument why uh, neutral relays may always remain necessary, even if you implement some kind of EPBS uh, approach so that everyone has access to a similar shape of latency reductions. And absolute latency reductions mean magnitude of selection costs is likely to be less. So even given uh, any relative latency discrepancies between bidders, if there's a long tail um, of, of time where the proposer needs to sign their bid, for example, or commit to a bid, um, this may mean that your adverse selection costs are likely to be larger um, if someone else comes, if bids after you. But now notice that this model is actually quite uh, applicable to order flow auctions as well. So we're just modeling the amount of MEV that's available over time, and there are some bidders. So this doesn't only work for PBS, it works for order flow auctions. Um, and a very likely candidate for order flow auctions is the loss versus rebalancing that can be extracted from um, decentralized exchanges. But in this model, we also require the uh, bidders in uh, order flow auctions to deal with the winner's curse, and this will impact auction revenue. So this might be, uh, you could maybe see this as uh, a decentralized exchange outsourcing price discovery to these bidders uh, in the order flow auction and then paying some, some parts of, of revenue to them uh, in the form of preventing their adverse selection costs. So in conclusion, the PBS um, model allows for latency being a sort of double-edged sword. Lower latency means that you are more likely to win the auction, but it also means that if you have high latency and you win the auction, this is probably bad news for you. So you'll need to take this into account in your bidding strategy. And this doesn't necessarily mean that all competition will be faced on latency, though. In this model, we don't account for exclusive order flow. Um, we don't account for your bid payments. So let's say that you have invested very heavily in latency optimizations. Um, if you still need to bid uh, in the PBS auction and your latency optimizations uh, weren't worth it, apparently, it, you could be running at a loss, and this wouldn't be sustainable, of course. And uh, the most important part is, I think, that there will be some sort of equal access to latency reductions uh, to re decrease adverse selection costs in any form of PBS auction mechanism. So that's uh, what I wanted to conclude with for today. much for the talk. Uh, I have a quick question around the external factors affecting MEV. 
So other than sex stacks arbitrage hodges, I can't really think of much else, which means that there are a portion of MV that's gonna be, you know, um, you, you know it right, right when the user places order, et cetera, which is non-decreasing. But the sex stacks can change it, changes and you know, make the bids larger or smaller. So I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on that? And yeah. Yeah, so I think for now, sex stacks is definitely like the largest parts of this. I think uh, a fallacy in modeling PBS is that we're looking too much at the current state. So maybe full domain MEV will become a larger part in future PBS mechanisms uh, in, in different market regimes, and we will be need, we'll need to look at this. Um, but for now, definitely, like, sex stacks will be the, the absolute largest, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for the talk, enjoyed it. I think one of the interesting things that this uh, points out is that you get to see other bids in the PBS auction, but in the like first stage bundle merge, you don't get to see other bids. So I'm wondering if you've thought about what the implications are from that when we have integrated builders who are kind of competing in this PBS auction for profits and non-integrated builders who are competing on the same opportunities but are uh, taking profits in the uh, sealed bid bundle merge auction. So is your question about the difference between the sealed bid auction and the like, uh, open outcry auction here? Yeah, just wondering if you've thought about the kind yeah. of potential winner's curse implications of this. I think in this model, we don't really assume that it's uh, either a sealed bid or an open outcry auction. We're more looking at your valuation. So even if um, you're in a system where you have no clue who else might be bidding, uh, there's always a chance that someone will come after you, and you'll need to return for this. Uh, so in a sealed bid auction, you need to return for this. In a uh, first price auction with bid cancellations, this is maybe easier because you could cancel your bid if you're like timely. Um, yeah, but that's, that's probably a different dynamic. Uh, but in sealed bid auctions, it would be a quite similar dynamic, dynamic yeah. Hello, one, two. Uh, question about the adverse selection. Um, so you, you had the slide mentioning that like as latency um, improves, like there's potential for adverse selection. Could you explain that a little bit more? Sorry? Can you explain a little bit like about the adverse selection on like the second last slide a little bit more? Yeah, so if you, the adverse selection is because someone else comes after you and they see that for example, the price has decreased. So if you're bidding at let's say T7 and someone else bids at T11, the fact that you win means that they saw some information that's probably disadvantageous for you because otherwise they would have bid more. So in this case, there's like some sort of adverse selection tools because um, the fact that they, yeah, the fact that they didn't bid more than you means that you bid too much basically. I see, thanks. Thank you, Julian. Thank you.